All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone had a, a, a wonderful uh, New Year's and uh, holiday season, and Happy New Year to you all. Uh, welcome back to another session um, in the Certificate Program in Practice-Based Research Methods. Uh, <clears throat> today's session is labeled Research Using Electronic Health Records and uh, Big Data. Uh, the Today's session is facilitated by uh, the, the Clinical Directors Network and the AMP Squared uh, Network of Virtual Trainings, uh, a virtual training series funded by the AHRQ. Uh, this gives you access to the live and archive sessions. Um, the certificate program in practice-based research methods is developed by Jim Werner in partnership with the AHRQ-funded PBRN Centers of Excellence. Uh, at this time, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Jim Warner. Great. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, I just want to say this is uh, developed in collaboration, really, between the eight P30s. Huh? LJ Fagnan and I are just kind of taking the lead on that. So um, welcome, everybody. And as uh, Vladimir said, ha Happy New Year, and welcome to uh, the fifth webinar in our certificate program in practice-based research methods, which is entitled Research Using Electronic Health Records and Big Data. Uh, we have another all-star team of collaborating presenters for you today. And it's my pleasure to introduce them, and I'll do that in alphabetical order. We have three presenters with us. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Laura May Baldwin. Dr. Baldwin is a professor of family medicine at the University of Washington, and she focuses on collaborating with her patients to maintain and improve their health. She completed medical school at the University of Southern California, residency at Swedish Medical Center, First Hill, and a research fellowship and a master's of public health at the University of Washington. Dr. Baldwin's research interests are conducting research with linked administrative databases, access to care for underserved communities, rural health, the healthcare workforce, Native American health, and perinatal health. So welcome, Dr. Baldwin. Next um, is Dr. Alex Fix. Alex is a primary care pediatrician and associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, also called CHOP. Uh, board certified in clinical informatics, Dr. Fix research is aimed at improving outcomes for ambulatory peds patients through collaborative practice-based research with a focus on improving, improving healthcare decision-making through health information technology. Much of his research is focused on fostering shared decision-making between clinicians and their families. Uh, Dr. Fix is also the director of the PROS Network, the American Academy of Pediatrics, P Pediatric Research and Office Settings Network, uh, which is one of the longest-standing uh, national PBRNs in the U.S. Um, and um, he's been involved in building the Collaborative Electronic Reporting System for Comparative Effectiveness Research, CER squared, um, and uh, is engaged in comparative effectiveness research studies uh, that include more than 1.2 million children from across multiple health systems in the U.S. Okay, so welcome, Dr. Alex Fix. So we have two Alexes with us today, Dr. Alex Fix and Dr. Alex Christ. Um, Alex Christ is an associate professor of family medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, and he's a practicing family physician at the Fairfax Family Practice Residency. Uh, Alex Christ is a co-director of the Virginia Ambulatory Outcomes Research Network, or ACORN, which is uh, a group of over 100 primary care practices throughout Virginia, representing the full spectrum of primary care structures and cultures. Uh, Dr. Christ is a member of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and is director of the Community Engaged Research for VCU's Center for Clinical and Translational Research, their, their CTSA. His personal research interests focus on implementation of preventive recommendations, patient-centered care, shared decision-making, cancer screening, health information technology, and practice transformation. So thank you, the three of you, for being with us today. Uh, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Uh, for, for our fellows, uh, as we have in the past, please use the chat feature. If you have a question, you can either um, type out your question or you can simply just say, I have a question, and we can call on you. Uh, we haven't really been using the raised hand feature 
So why don't we just use the chat box and you can either say, just simply say I have a question or you can uh, actually type out the content of your question. Okay. Uh, without any further ado, I will turn it over to our presenters. Great, and this is Laura May Baldwin. I'm going to go ahead and get us started because I've got the first few slides. So thank you so much for inviting us. This has been a, a wonderful collaborative effort for the two Alexes and me in developing this presentation about using electronic health record data to conduct PDRN research. So what we are hoping to do today is um, help you understand how to get started with using electronic health record data and health information technology across uh, the entire life cycle of research in a PBRN setting. And we'll talk about what, a, what, what we mean by research life cycle. Uh, and also across uh, the translational science spectrum, and we'll talk about what, what we mean by that as well. Um, to be aware of what the possible uses of, uh, are for, for electronic health record data and uh, health information technology in conducting uh, research in the PBRN. Uh, tell you what, what makes it easier and what makes it harder to, to bringing in those data and, and HIT in your research project. And then finally, um, to make sure that we touch on uh, the important uh, factor of ensuring that PDRN partners actually benefit from these projects. So we're going to spend a few minutes in introduction, and then we're going to give you three examples, and we're going to give some time um, uh, at, at the end of each of these segments so that you have time to um, ask questions. So hopefully that will give us plenty of time for discussion. So first, um, this is a, a pretty typical slide of the, of the translational science spectrum that starts from discovery through T1 research, translation to humans, T2, translation to patients, T3, to practice, and T4, to population health. And what we thought we would do is just sort of talk a little bit about how electronic health records and HIT can be used in each segment of this translational science spectrum, because you might be working at, um, at different ends of this. Discovery, um, which I think of as, as observations that lead to sort of new knowledge that might impact human health, often is thought of as lab-based. That's how it's talked about. But really, discovery can uh, emanate from clinical practice. And I think that's uh, important to consider. And the electronic health record can really be a tool for discovery. I think a good example of this is, that's out there right now is the Precision Medicine Initiative um, effort. Whether, whether, whether or not you're uh, supportive of Precision Medicine, what they're trying to do is link genomic discovery um, and information to health status and to clinical outcomes using electronic health record uh, data. And similarly, the CDC right now is using electronic health record uh, uh, data to develop a longitudinal cohort of patients who may be at risk for diabetes, measure those uh, risk, measure risk factors among those individuals using, again, data from the electronic health record to look at progression to diabetes. So that's really, I think, discovery uh, research. And the electronic health record is very useful there. In terms of T1 translation to humans and T2 translation to patients, that often involves proof of concept work, phase one through three clinical trials. And EHR data can be used to identify cohorts for these studies. Um, oftentimes, electronic health record data can be leveraged across multiple healthcare systems or clinics. And we can, we'll talk about that in some of our examples. And this can be particularly helpful when I'm trying to identify adequate numbers of patients with rare conditions, for example. In T3 translation to practice, um, phase four clinical trials, again, can benefit from cohort discovery from the electronic health records. But there are also opportunities to actually use the EHR or HIT tools to uh -huh. gather data. Mobile apps, for example, you can measure outcomes for comparative effectiveness research, health disparities research. And HIT, like clinical decision support tools, can also be used for implementation and dissemination of evidence-based interventions. And, um, Finally, electronic health record data can support T4 research or translation to population health. States are now considering how to create all-payer claims data sources and enrich those with electronic health record data that aren't available in claims data. Um, and there are new HIT tools like um, web-enabled blood pressure kiosks that can be placed in the community that can be used to identify new patients with hypertensives, perhaps recruit and consent them electronically to clinical studies and then connect them to clinical care. So 
I hope this gives you a sense of how electronic health records in HIT can really um, span the entire translational spectrum and uh, be used for research. Now, how um, do electronic health record data in HIT support the research life cycle? On the left-hand side of this table is one example of what the research life cycle uh, stages look like. So everything from building collaborations all the way to disseminating findings. And on the right-hand side, there are examples of the kinds of support that EHR data and HIT can provide to the different stages in the life cycle. So in building collaborations, for example, um, you can tailor your HIT or your electronic health record data queries to make sure that you're answering questions that you've elicited from practices that are important to them. Um, you can, again, in identifying or choosing the problem, you may have used the electronic health record to do this database discovery. When you're developing your research approach, um, you might use an HIT-based intervention, as I mentioned, uh, or EHR data might provide the research data itself for defining outcomes and delineating your mediator and moderator var variables. Um, in selecting a sample, you might use EHR to facilitate your cohort discovery. Mm -hmm. And in terms of collecting high-quality data, um, the electronic health record has kind of a mixed um, reputation in this regard, but it certainly can provide discrete data fields which use standardized coding like ICD, CPT, um, and other kinds of codes for things like laboratory tests. And so those standardized um, coding mechanisms can be very helpful. And finally, in disseminating findings, the electronic health record might have a patient portal that can be used to communicate uh, research findings with patients. So there are lots of, these are just some examples of ways that uh, the, EHR, the EHR data and HIT can support research across its uh, life cycle. And I think I'll turn it over to Alex. So this is, is Alex Christ, and, and I'm going to take two seconds with the next two slides and just talk about, um, as part of the introduction, some of the other things that you could do with EHRs and HIT for research. So, um, and the life cycle is really important to think about, and then as a researcher, we often uh, look toward the HR as great sources of data. Um, but of course, for research perspectives, um, you also have um, an opportunity to um, use technology, um, create new technology, or change existing technology and, and um, have that be part of what your research is, is about. And I, I put at the beginning there that, that doing this is hard, and that's a really important thing to, to remember, and it's often a big barrier. Um, a lot of times the technologies that we're using are created by um, uh, big companies and, and sometimes as a PBRN researcher it's difficult to get in and to make changes. Uh, but there are opportunities to do this and, and thinking about how you can partner uh, with multidisciplinary teams. We've had lots of success working with some folks in our computer science department and, and other divisions across our school. You can partner with your EHR vendor and some of the work that we've done um, when we go to our, our vendor as, um, as a, 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 a purchaser of their product, they're, they're sometimes happy to work with us. Um, and then you can look for developers who are doing something similar. And I've put two resources here on this slide just to be aware of. The um, one on the left is um, a, a document that the um, Math Craig's Health Information Technology Committee put together where they looked at meaningful use and what electronic health records could currently do. They mapped that against the functions of primary care. And they said, well, where are gaps? Where do we need new tools, new systems, new workflows to better support primary care? So that's a, a place where you can get some ideas on some studies and interventions that need to be done. And similarly, on the right is a piece that came out from Family Medicine for uh, America's Health, FMAH, and I'm sure you all have talked some about that. It's like the old um, uh, uh, future of family medicine from 2004. Uh, but they did an outline, too, of where HIT should go to better support um, health care and primary care. The second part of HIT uh, research, just to think a little bit about, and this is a lot easier to do and maybe more important is, is not just creating and testing new functions um, or new technologies, but, but thinking about um, doing uh, studies to look at how to get them to be put into practice better. And this is dissemination and implementation research. And in reality, um, 
we might be able to move the needle more on health by getting us to use and getting patients and the healthcare systems to better use the systems we have than to create new systems. And this can be a much, much easier um, uh, type of a research portfolio to work on. Um, and there's, uh, you know, lots of documentation that just having technology doesn't improve outcomes. It really is how we use it. And then there are frameworks to think about for doing dissemination and implementation uh, research, like REAIM, which looks at reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. So your outcomes and the types of things you could be studying are everything from how do we get people to use it more, how do we get people to agree to use it, um, how do they use it, in what meaningful ways do they use it, and then what types of factors are going to contribute to better use and better outcomes. Alex, I'll turn it over to you now. Hi, everyone. It's Alex Fix over at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Good to speak to everyone this morning. I wanted to first say feel free to interrupt if you have questions. We are trying to move along at a fairly swift clip to make sure that there's plenty of time to discuss how what we're talking about today might um, be related to the career goals of folks in the program and um, you know, to particular research projects that, that folks are working on today. Um, thanks to Laura May and Alex for giving a broad overview. This last part of the introduction just dives in a little bit more detail to specific examples of how EHR data might be used. So here on this slide is shown one study um, that really focuses on the issue of pilot data. So this was an obesity study, and we had electronic health records of um, kids across our practices, and we were able to very quickly, for putting into a grant, find the number of eligible children. Those would be those with overweight or obesity, the percent who are female, um, the average age of those kids, and the average time between visits. And with this pilot data, and, and the nice thing in, in many settings is that work preparatory to research doesn't necessarily require an IRB, so sometimes it can be fairly quick to get information like this if you have the right resources at your site. Um, you can do, in addition to cross-sectional uh, analyses like the one shown on the prior slide, longitudinal um, analyses. So in this case, the question might be, well, what's happening to our kids who are overweight and obese at baseline? Do they actually um, lose weight on their own? Are they getting heavier? Are they staying the same? And so the pie graph on the left um, shows that of those kids obese at baseline, that the vast, vast majority remained obese, and only a very small fraction um, dropped to the overweight range, and almost no one returned to healthy weight. With the overweight group, not as severely uh, affected, uh, more were able to return to a healthy weight. But it gives a longitudinal perspective that can be very helpful in motivating a variety of problems. Weight is just one example, but I think it, it, it highlights the utility of some of the EHR data to motivate and support grant applications and projects. Um, the other thing that EHR data can do wonderfully well and that we use fairly extensively in our local PDRN here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, that's called the Pediatric Research Consortium, is to create rosters to enable subject recruitment. So you may know, for example, at a series of fork practices that agreed to participate that you're looking for kids from 9 to 12 years of age who are male and who have asthma. And using a system of generating these rosters, which IRBs will often approve, um, you can then be, have your research team be there when these folks come for their visits, recruit them and talk to them in the office, and uh, really increase the efficiency of subject recruitment, which oftentimes is one of the linchpins to completing a successful study. And oftentimes in our setting, these are sent each Friday to the research team, and then the study team can maximize or target specific dates for being in practices. So for example, if you're in a multi-site project, your roster might have 20 children who are eligible at one site, but only three at another, and it's very easy to decide in that context where the research assistant should go on any given day. The next slide looks at a somewhat <coughs> excuse me, different method that we've used for subject recruitment. In this case, we embedded a drop-down list within a template. This is within our EPIC electronic record. And um, this was done a number of years ago, but I think the approach is still very much valid. And 
what happens is that in the process of care and documentation, a clinician might come to something like, in this case, what type of formula were babies receiving? And there was a goal of recruiting infants who were re receiving soy formula. So for those soy formula fed infants, it was pretty easy for the clinician as they're going through and getting the history just to be prompted if the child was receiving so soy to ask the family, oh, there's a research study going on where they're interested in talking to families of children whose babies are fed soy formula, would you be interested in being contacted? Then that generates a list that goes to the research team that can then subsequently reach out to the family. And as you can see, um, this greatly facilitated recruitment for this particular study with here in Perk, 410 children being enrolled in 12 months, whereas in a second site with a similar patient volume, there were only 86, um, and that was over a period that was 50% longer. So ways to really use the EHR to improve efficiencies and recruitment. And this is a, an approach we're using more broadly now, which is EHR-based forms. They're programmed into the EHR. The criteria in terms of eligibility and the purpose is listed, so when the clinician opens a chart, this appears. And the clinician can turn to the family again and say, oh, you meet criteria for a study, um, for example, about breastfeeding or premature infants. Um, would you be interested in hearing more about it? And then this provides a way to um, quickly get the preferred number for the family to the research team. And the other thing it allows the uh, clinician to do is to filter so that if there are children coming in who are potentially eligible, for example, and they actually really don't meet criteria, the clinician will know that in a way that you might not be able to discern completely from EHR data and can indicate that. And so it both helps focus attention on families that are interested, but also remove attention from families who either have a preference not to participate or whose clinical history might not fit the needs of the study. Finally, the EHR is really a great source for intervention research. There's a wealth of knowledge about clinical decision support um, and its ability to motivate, improve outcomes and care. And without talking about that too extensively, this is just an example of a custom alert we created for vaccinations. Um, the literature around vaccines for decision support is one of the strongest in terms of improving outcomes and by very readily extracting information from the EHR and presenting it in a way that um, applies a particular logic, in this case the immunization rules, outcomes can be improved. And finally, um, not all EHR interventions have to be within the EHR, but the EHRs can generate rosters. In this case, this is a feedback report that went out to clinicians to motivate improved vaccination behavior for the HPV vaccine, there's literature to suggest that feedback is stronger if you include both achievable benchmarks and you allow clinicians to look at their own numbers as well as those of um, salient related groups, including their practice and network. So this is just a slice from one real clinician for one study that showed how they were doing in terms of vaccinating kids with HPV if they came in and were due for the vaccine at an actual visit. More broadly, and the, the larger extension of this that I think will be covered a bit later on, is the use of these tools for population health. So having emphasized how um, many wonderful roles the EHR might have in terms of research recruitment and facilitating research, um, I'll turn now to our first example, which is using national EHR data sets and, and this idea of big data to improve care and just uh, don't mean to be a spoiler, but one of the key themes here I think is to proceed uh, with caution and really be careful about validating data elements. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we proceed. So what is big data anyway? One of the most common definitions is um, that it's a broad term for data sets that are so large or complex that traditional data processing applications are inadequate. So for example, if you wanted to, um, uh, if you wanted to uh, get the genome information on the entire population of a particular school, that would certainly be a big data set. Some EHR data sets, while getting toward big data, aren't necessarily that big. Um, Data provenance is an important issue in thinking about the big data. So this is where does the, the data come from? And there's this first law 
of informatics that basically says data shall only be used for the purpose for which they were collected. So a lot of people break that rule and break that rule fairly readily and extensively, and I support that. But I think it's important to keep in mind that the context from which data emerge are very important in determining how best they are used and what the limitations of their use can be. Here's another um, cousin of that, which is the law of medical information from Berg and Gorman. And this, you can see, is now about 16 or 17 years old. And it says, the further information has to be able to circulate, the more diverse context it has to be usable in, the more work is required to disentangle the information from the context of its production. The question then become, that then becomes pertinent is, who has to do the work and who reaps the benefits? And I would say, as opposed to prospective data collection, where there's more work in generating the data, with these big data sets, there's a really a bonus, sorry, an onus, a burden on the researcher of trying to make sense and make sure the data is valid. So as a specific example, I wanted to dive in and talk about some of the work we've been doing with the American Academy of Pediatrics on the comparative effectiveness research through collaborative electronic reporting consortium known as CER squared. And the subtitle here is Opportunities and Cautions as Data Gets Big. So CER squared is a collaboration of primary care informatics researchers studying pediatric care through EHR and related electronic health records. It grew out of a realization that large data sets are really needed um, for many types of 21st century practice-based research. And it joins existing EHR-based research networks into an electronic Uber network to get larger sample size and be able to look at rarer events, for example, the use of uncommon medications or side effects of that use. It features longitudinal electronic um, health records, so there's follow-up time from 2000 to 2014, and that'll be extended. It's clinical data supplemented by administrative data. There's more than 1.2 million kids seen by diverse practitioners in diverse settings across the United States. There's a good team of pharmacoepidemiologists because there's a drug interest, health services researchers, and informatics folks collaborating. And it really um, provides a foundation for EHR data in addition to being used on its own to be combined with data collected prospectively from pediatricians, parents, or children um, for interventional or prospective research studies, that, you know, to make it a much more robust platform. So these are the sites from across the country. You can see um, most of the states in the U.S. are covered with some notable um, exceptions. And the data model really involves the flow and the, the standardization of data across different health systems. So there's an ePROS network and the American Academy of Family Physicians and QuireNet network. Um, data from there, data from Perkin Metro Health that come from Epic Electronic Health Records, and data from Boston University that was in Centricity and now switched over to Epic all have to be standardized. And for this particular data set, um, we've used something called the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, or OMOT format, which is one of the um, formats that's increasingly being used and is being used by PCORnet sites as well. So governance is a big issue when data comes together. There has to be an owner, in this case the American Academy of Pediatrics. There have to be regulations about who can use it and who has access to it and where it's going to be stored and also a formula and mechanism for bringing new research to it. And so one of the big things I wanted to get out to this group is that this data set isn't just meant for an internal group, but is meant for others to use. And folks can definitely feel free to contact me if they're interested in potentially using the data set. So just some examples of the cautions that you need to uh, have in place when analyzing EHR data. So growth data is one of the most fundamental things in pediatrics and I would say in medicine more broadly. There's 1.2 million kids in the CER squared data set, but there are all kinds of errors in growth. People substitute metric and English system values. They put decimal points in the wrong place. They make all sorts of mistakes. They put the height in the weight field or the weight in the height field. And how might these be sorted out? So shown in the slide is Carrie Damont, one of our collaborators. And just to summarize briefly, what she's developed is um, an approach to take weight data, which can look like this, where you see people jumping all over the place. Um, there's all kinds of invalid information, but there's also valid outliers as well as invalid inliers. 
Um, and what she has done using an algorithm that takes the standard deviation of the weighted moving average of the different weight points within a child, which is maybe beyond the scope of what we'll talk about today unless folks have questions, you can take data that looks like this and clean it to have data that looks like this, where valid outliers are preserved, but invalid points, even within normal parameters, are excluded. Other problems include missing data. So although the Federal Meaningful Use Program really insists on um, collecting up the collection of data on race and ethnicity within practices, that doesn't always happen and hasn't necessarily become standard. So it's important to have creative ways to think about addressing missing data. Um, so as it says here, missing data on race and ethnicity is common. Um, and we asked the question, could an adaptation of a, previous, of a method previously used in adults be helpful in pediatrics? So this is called the Bayesian Improved Surname Geocoding, which takes into account U.S. Census and your surname in order to address missingness. And the bottom line there was that the new method worked better than other traditional methods to reduce bias. I think more broadly this speaks to um, just a whole field of research which is thinking about how we can manage and use EHR data in a way that preserves um, its validity. But here you can look at um, two continuous outcomes. So in the black group, the true value was minus 10. And these are theoretical outcomes. In the Hispanic, it was plus 10. If you have all data, you can see you get results that just about match. Um, however, if you use complete case analysis, throwing out missing data, indicator variable methods, or even multiple imputations, the values you get are very far removed from the true values. So using the surname and the geocoded method really improves um, the accuracy of how this data is used. So and just to sort of show another, it, it's not all gloom and doom, but one of the things as you start to pull this data together is you can start to look at, well, as practice policies come in, as the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force issues new recommendations, how is it affecting practice? In this one example in 2011, the AAP ADHD practice guidelines were provided for the first time, um, and, they, and for the first time included the diagnosis and treatment of ADHD in preschoolers. So we did a small study that looked at the impact on practice of this on the care of children with ADHD in the sites in our network, and these were four and five-year-olds. And what we found was that while rates of diagnosing were increasing before the guidelines were released, those actually flattened a bit afterwards. There was no longer a significant increase in the rate. And rates of prescribing actually didn't differ, which addressed a common concern, which was that if you write guidelines that include preschoolers and information about psychotropic medications for them, that all of a sudden there would be huge numbers of preschoolers on psychotropic medication. So um, recap on big data. data is being repurposed. This has inherent challenges. Data cleaning is critical, and methodological inf innovations are needed to do it well. Once cleaned, pool data can facilitate the elucidation of nat national practice patterns and even the assessment of rare outcomes. And we welcome folks from this group or others who are in interested to participate and happy to answer questions on this um, as we go. And um, I'll turn it over now to the next phase of our project, which looks at, and I think it's Laura May, um, from regional data sharing infrastructure to small scale EHR data projects. So, so this, uh, so this LJ, and so, you know, oftentimes uh, we work uh, in PBRNs, we work in settings where there are just a variety of electronic health records with varying capabilities, and I just wonder, you know, it's different if you've got a, a uh, uh, a network that's all doing uh, a, a single EPIC EHR versus one that's got maybe six, seven different EHRs and wondered what uh, what uh, your experience has been with that. So um, in our pros network, we have lots of different practices with different vendors. And I think it really depends on the complexity of the question. So in certain cases, for example, if you wanted to know um, what fraction of kids recruited in a particular research study had received a particular vaccine, practices can generally pull it and use the EHR data themselves to, to address that. Um, 
if you're looking to do research on more of a large scale, there are you know vendors and bigger data sets that then can pull um, records from the different vendor products in order to facilitate the research, but it adds considerable complexity. And the other thing that we've been finding in some more recent studies is that um, practices are increasingly, though it's slow, having ability to pull data from their own records. And so I think in the future it may be that the challenge is um, practices drawing a common data set and then, and then putting it together. But it definitely adds complexity um, and makes things more difficult. And you really have to see when the sites you're working with what types of capabilities they have. Okay, we have a question from Ann Gagliotti. Ann, would you like to go ahead? Her question is in the chat box. Right. If she doesn't have um, access uh, um, over uh, the phone, I can just read it. Can you talk a bit about who you might need on your research team to implement and operationalize the data cleaning approaches, like the Bayesian approach you discussed, and how to make those connections? Um, that's a great question. So the Bayesian approach mentioned is published, and I, uh, I think I cited that reference on the slide. So I think the big thing there might be to work with a bio, as opposed to needing informatics expertise, if you have a data set where you need to impute race and you actually have surname in your data set, um, you can apply the algorithm, but one might want to consult. I think for that particular case, a biostatistician would be helpful. The growth cleaning example is being prepared for publication. Once that's out, the hope is that we would um, make available the, uh, the code, which is written in R, the R statistical package, to be able to apply that to the data. So you, need, you would need a, a biostatistician who could use R. OK, great. Um, we have two more questions from Tamer Saeed. First, how, how do we ensure that data cleaning would not interfere with results? And secondly, how can we ensure that methodology can be used, used can be generalized? OK, so I think in that first question, and I'm flipping back to that slide with the um, surname algorithm, I think the real worry is that um, if you do data cleaning and wind up, in this case, throwing out missing data, um, you potentially could bias results by not cleaning or not addressing the missingness. So that's, that's one question. Then in terms of the growth data, and I'll flip to um, that briefly, um, what, what we're doing and the way to know that the algorithm doesn't introduce error. And in any case, it's, it, it's, there's always a trade-off between potentially introducing some error while you're removing some, is we've reviewed hundreds of charts by hand to compare what the um, electronic algorithm does to what seasoned clinicians might do clinically in the same situation to ensure that results are valid. So I would say, again, you know, along my theme of using caution with electronic health record uh, data in general, it takes an awful lot of back and forth between iterative design of the algorithm and manual review of the data to ensure that what the algorithm is doing is valid um, before one would want to make this um, publicly available. Okay, great. Any other questions at this time? You know, uh, this is Alex Christ. Um, uh, while we're waiting to see if there's another quick question, I wanted to just add to Alex uh, Fix's response to LJ about um, uh, working with uh, practices with multiple different um, uh, EMRs, because that's certainly our experience in Virginia. And, and I think a good learning point for the fellows to think about as well is, is there is more and more direction towards trying to um, get some standardization around data extraction. And, and as Alex was saying, um, practices have more capability of doing data extraction themselves. And I think over the next five years, that will hopefully continue to grow. Um, and then there's a lot of functions that are at least um, meant to, to standardize this process, like the CCDA 
uh, extraction or different EMRs will have um, scripts built in where they can, can generate um, data with respect to, to outcomes that, that Medicare and Meaningful Use and others have kind of standardized. So that's just something to think about and look towards as um, folks are designing studies and thinking about working with different practices is the standardization features. That's great to know. Okay, I think uh, our presenters can go ahead and proceed. Yeah, good. Well, this is Laura May again, and I'm going to talk about example two, and, and what we've been talking about is a perfect lead-in. I didn't answer the question because I'm actually going to talk about our practice-based research network um, electronic uh, data sharing infrastructure. And we, and I'm going to talk about everything from our development of a multi-site data sharing infrastructure to um, projects that involve uh, the practices themselves doing electronic health record um, searches. So you'll get a sense of the range of this in our network, which is called the Lamy Region Practice and Research Network. It involves 60 clinics across roughly 24 organizations um, in the five-state region that um, we serve. And 19 of these clinics are members of what we call DataQuest, and that's our data sharing um, infrastructure that uh, shares electronic health record data for research. And we use a similar infrastructure to um, the network that Alex just talked about, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. So. Um, what is DataQuest? It's basically a collaboration between the WPRN, which is the, our research, uh, our, our PDRN, and our CTSA. And so we have biomedical informaticist who is a part of our team um, who really has helped us create this, um, this data sharing infrastructure. So it's been a real partnership there. Um, and uh, we've been very lucky to have a combination of a psychologist informaticist, so someone who is a clinician at the same time that she is an informaticist. And that's really um, helped to um, bring, uh, to, to facilitate the engagement because she understands some, some of the clinical um, constraints of our practices. It's a technology that basically um, aligns data repositories across practices. So what that means, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, is that each practice actually has its own clinical data repository that brings in standardized uh, variables that um, either sits at the practice on a server or it can sit in the cloud um, on a server. Um, and then the data are de-identified um, in those repositories, um, although they come from obviously identified data. Um, and we work with uh, a vendor to do all of this. And then the de-identified data are sent to a central warehouse that's hosted at the University of Washington, which is um, where our PDR and coordinating center sits. And, uh, you know, we're very interested, obviously, in supporting both research and quality improvements and aligning with national efforts. So Alex mentioned PCORnet, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute that is funded by PCORI, um, and we are affiliated with one of the PCORnet sites. Um, Dartnet Institute is actually the uh, nonprofit vendor that does the, um, the technology piece of this, but also um, brings together electronic health records uh, data across other practice-based research networks, so we um, are able to be part of a national network in that way. And of course, the NIH Collaboratory, we're not part of that, but that's another distributed research network that is doing this kind of work. So we want to be able to align with efforts like this, which is one of the reasons that um, our CTSA has really invested in this data sharing infrastructure. And um, actually, our, our pictures look quite a bit alike uh, in terms of how this works. So you. Uh, you can imagine there's practice one, it might have all scripts, practice two might have uh, next gen, practice three might have centricity. Um, so each of those three electronic health records pulls the data into a standardized database and you can see the dotted line there. And uh, that line shows that there's uh, a firewall between, uh, for, uh, between that and, and the next sort of level of where the data sit. Um, so that represents what sits at the local site. And then with uh, appropriate permissions in place, um, a memorandum of understanding um, that we have with our sites, the de-identified data can come into the DataQuest data repository that's a warehouse that sits um, at the University of Washington and pushed from the sites quarterly. 
Um, and then with data use agreements in place, those data can be used for research. Um, the, and the clinics, of course, have to approve each project. And I would have to say that governance, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is, has definitely been a, a major piece of creating this model. And we've uh, published on this extensively as well. Um, so that's just a quick uh, uh, trip through the, what, what the structure looks like. We've also been working uh, to create a data discovery tool that we call Find It. And this is a way that researchers can actually look at what's in the data. Um, you can actually go to this if you go to datacrest.iths.org, which I listed on the left. Um, and you can see at the bottom of this slide, this is just a, um, a screenshot, that um, you can browse the different data types. And we have information on um, you know, how many patients there are, um, of different ages, um, different uh, sexes, race, ethnicity, languages spoken, um, medications, vital signs, um, and so forth. We also have an ability to browse by diagnosis, which means you can uh, type in an ICD-9 diagnosis and see how many individuals there are um, in uh, our data set with a particular diagnosis. And then we have a, a common conditions um, set where we, we basically pull together uh, a variety of different diagnoses that might represent common conditions in primary care like um, uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, that kind of thing. And then a data dictionary that talks a little bit about how, um, what the variables are and, and their derivation. So this is not meant to be a cohort finding tool. Uh, we do not have a cohort finding tool that um, allows you to cross a lot of the different variables, but it's really a way as a researcher that you can look at um, our data and say, yeah, there might be enough pregnant patients to be able to do my research in this network. And it will tell you how many sites you would be approaching to um, meet that number, to, to receive that number of patients in your, um, for your study. Um, so uh, we wanted to talk a lot about strengths and challenges. I mean, DataQuest has really been a remarkable tool for us. It stimulated um, our PDRN to be able to collaborate on many, many grants. Um, in the last couple of years, 13 grants from everything from small pilot studies to very large-scale pragmatic clinical trials. We've, it's been quite a, uh, quite a stimulus for lots of uh, scholarly products on the science of data sharing. Uh, which, uh, which is, I, I, I would say, still in its infancy. Um, but there are many challenges, as Alex pointed out, and we wanted um, you, before you ran off, to say, hey, let's do this in our PBRN to understand what some of those are. The costs are significant. Um, and they're not just the vendor costs. And, you know, right now, you know, we pay roughly $12,000 a site for installation. It's constantly changing and increasing as the vendor realizes, gosh, it actually costs more than we thought to do this. Uh, and then $2,500 per site annually for maintenance, so it's not an insignificant cost. And then to uh, the data extraction um, often must be done by um, the vendor at this point, and that also costs a significant amount. But beyond those vendor costs, in order to manage and just conduct the operations to be able to navigate governance with the site, they're constantly changing their electronic health records or updating their electronic health records. Um, so that means that we have to be, um, you know, working with the vendor and working with the site um, to track and manage all of that. Um, takes quite a bit of uh, project management time. And then um, what Alex talked about in terms of monitoring and maintaining data quality, or even just understanding your data quality, um, is also a, a time-consuming undertaking. Um, I mentioned navigating governance structures. Um, those are the governance structures of our own institution to create the warehouse, as well as uh, the clinical institutions. And clinics very often now are part of larger health systems, which have much more complex governance structures. So when you're asking someone to sign a memorandum of understanding, it may go to someone in that institution that you haven't been communicating with all along about the data sharing infrastructure, and they will ask a lot of uh, new questions. So it's, um, it, it can be quite, quite formidable. Um, I already talked about the changing electronic health records and the upgrades that can actually derail the infrastructure. Um, and there's an enormous amount of variation in the EHR structure and how EHRs are used. So even once you pull the uh, variables into a, a, a data repository that is standardized, 
you may still um, see an enormous amount of variation, as Alex pointed out, in how folks enter the data into the, into the uh, chart itself or into the record itself. And for us as a practice-based research network, not all the sites can participate. There are limits in terms of what we can financially afford. And some of the time, their institutions just will not agree to them being a part of it. So that leaves some of our sites out. And there are sort of, we didn't want to create a situation in which there were haves and have-nots around this data sharing infrastructure, uh, given the diversity and complexity. So that's why we actually turned um, to using some small-scale electronic health record data projects to um, help the site see how they might be able to use their electronic health records to increase quality, and also to increase our research capacity in our practice-based research network. I think, as you are probably well aware, practices are so frustrated by uh, the fact that they invest a lot of time in entering data into their electronic health records and often aren't getting out of the records what they hoped to. So this is a way for us to work with sites to, to just demonstrate ways that they might be able to work with their electronic health records. So this slide kind of uh, talks about the process that we've used. And we have a number of tools, and I'll show you one of them, that, um, that we've developed for the sites to make it as easy as possible for as many sites to participate in this kind of project. So we start um, with topic selection. And we actually use these projects as an engagement tool. So this is, these are projects that really emanate from our practice-based research network that make it as relevant as possible to them. So we have a, a site champion at each of our um, organizations. And they um, nominate topic areas that they would like to study um, using an electronic health record um, data project. And we have provided them with um, some experience in learning what kinds of questions might fit for an electronic health record um, project and what might not. Um, and so our coordinating center then takes those topic areas and questions that are nominated and vets those. Um, and our coordinating center um, consists of two faculty members and a network coordinator. So we then um, take those questions that they've raised and say, gosh, which ones really are compatible with a simple, simple electronic health record um, project at their site? Um, and then we um, develop a subset of the uh, questions from the topics and questions that they've raised and send, it back, send them back out to the site champions, and they choose the topic. They choose the question um, after they've seen how we've kind of uh, adapted the questions that they've sent. So um, all of our sites have actually chosen the question themselves. And we then set about to develop what are the parameters for a data extraction that we think sites across our network can use um, for using a variety of electronic health records. So we draft those parameters. And we ask whether there are site champions that want to join a small working group to vet the parameters and provide feedback to us. And this has been an essential component of the project. We commonly don't understand um, the context of their data, what they can and can't do. So we might draft parameters and send them out. And then they come back to us both with excellent clinical feedback as well as um, feasibility feedback for us. And so we then finalize the parameters with all of that feedback. Um, and as you can imagine, the small working group feels pretty invested in the questions that, um, that we end up um, targeting with this kind of project. We then um, invite. Uh, the participating, um, well, we, we then invite all of our practices to participate, identify which ones choose to participate. And then they will have study champions that will be um, the, the primary point of contact and really driving the project at their site. So the coordinating center will hold webinars and train all of the interested site champions and any IT staff that they might have that will be actually doing the, the extraction on the study protocol. Um, and the coordinating center often finds that during those webinars, some new feedback comes to, comes to us. And we may, might revise the parameters again before we finalize them um, and then provide them to the site. We then go into the data collection phase. We usually give our sites about three months to, get, to gather the data um, and provide them back to us in aggregate um, to the coordinating center for analysis. And when I say analysis, it, this, these are very simple. Um, more like pilot data 
um, project because what we do, and I'll show you in a moment, is we send them a table to ask for aggregate data. And that way, this does not end up um, being considered human subject by our IRB, and therefore, this is completely IRB exempt, which is a huge um, benefit to this um, strategy. Um, and so they provide that back to us. We package it um, in a way that gives feedback, and I'll show you that in a moment. And then um, we disseminate those results back both to individual sites that have provided data and to all um, of our WPRN members. And this entire process we do within a one-year time period. So we have a one-year engagement project. We've had one for the last, um, well, we're going into our third year. So this is an example of what um, of, a, of a data query table. It's very simple. We say what's the denominator, what are the numerators. This was a project that looked at um, sleep medication used in primary care practice, and we wanted to look at different combinations of sleep medications. So we gave them the names of the medications and um, asked them to tell us how many adult patients they had with a visit to their clinic during the study period, and we had a we had another page that uh, told them exactly how to define adults, how to define a visit, how to define study period. And then we gave them a list of what group A, B, C, and D sleep medications were, and then asked them for the numerators um, by, um, by sex. And then returning results to sites is obviously critical. This is an example of the um, one pager that we provide back um, both to sites um, and uh, present at our annual meeting. Um, you can see that we acknowledge the contributors um, to, the, to the project, and you can see there are, are many of them. We um, basically show, you know, give a brief introduction like you would on a poster. And then on the right-hand side in the results, we actually show um, results by quote unquote site one, two, three, four. Um, the sites know who they are. Um, but uh, no one else knows who the, who the sites are. I mean, they, everyone knows which sites participated, but they don't know who's who. And so this is a way to look at overall in our network as well as by site um, how much variation there is. And the sites find this um, very, very stimulating, and it's a great conversation at our um, annual meeting. Um, so, uh, it, and it motivates our sites to really think about um, next steps. Um, so this project, I mean, we really have been able to involve as many sites as we'd like to. We have an opportunity to be engaged in the science, in the data collection, um, and in results interpretation. Um, most importantly, no IRB approvals were required. Um, but there are some challenges, and there are definite limitations. These, um, there is no process that we have for assessing data quality um, or validation. We have not done any validation of the data um, at the individual site. So these results really, I think, are more preliminary studies type of um, projects. We have no individual data for research specifically. Um, and as a network, we have limited resources to support the follow-on quality improvement efforts. We've really worked to um, be able to provide them with some webinars on what do you do when you are able to gather these data from your site? Um, what are the next steps in terms of quality improvement? Um, and uh, so, but we, but at this point, the sites are kind of taking it from there on their own. And we usually have at our annual meeting not just um, a presentation of the results, but also a presentation from one of our sites that has taken the data and taken it to the next step so that they demonstrate to the rest of the site, how did we use these data at our site? What kind of quality project did we take on? So um, let's see. Uh, I guess in terms of overall lessons learned, I think that electronic health record-based projects um, are a very powerful tool for engaging PBRN sites and research. And so my, my sort of theme, um, uh, Alex's was about data quality and caution. Mine is about engagement. So for the small scale electronic health record projects, these were highly collaborative, responsive to our site uh, interests. Um, and they ended up demonstrating site capabilities, both to the sites themselves. So they've learned, oh, OK, this is how I might take on a project myself using electronic health record data. Um, and we have some training sites as well, so um, a resident might be able to take on something like this. Um, and it's also demonstrated to us what our sites are capable of. So which sites can pull data from their own um, electronic health records? 
and who has the staff to do that. In terms of larger scale data sharing, there's a much greater commitment for the site. They have to be able to provide us information on the data context or origins or provenance, as Alex pointed out, the definition there. Um, but it engages them quite actively as collaborators with academic investigators on pragmatic clinical trials, implementation, and dissemination research. So for sites that have really wanted to have that level of collaboration as study team members um, on larger um, on larger research projects. This has been a wonderful way to engage them in that. And so I think that's it for my presentation. Yeah. So I'll just um, leave it on that slide and take any questions. Uh, yeah, this is Jim Warner. Um, going back to uh, the recruitment and engagement of healthcare systems in DataQuest, do they perceive any particular benefits for participating? Uh, I can see that being potentially a big hurdle to overcome. Yeah, so, um, and when you say healthcare systems, you're talking about the larger systems as opposed to smaller clinics, or are you talking about the whole gambit? Um, I'm really thinking more about the large, yeah, the larger systems who are really focused on the bottom line. And um, you know, yeah. how does this factor into their their overall mission and what they're trying to do? Yeah. So at this time, we actually have focused our DataQuest network on smaller clinical systems. So we have um, three FQHCs that are a part of DataQuest, and then we have um, two um, critical access hospital um, network sets of clinics. Um, that are that are part of our our net. Well, actually, now we have four uh, critical access hospitals and their affiliated clinics that are part of our DataQuest system. So um, those systems, um, which are much smaller than the kinds of health systems that you've talked about, they really often take the lead from the providers in their clinics who say this is an important tool for us because. We're interested in being engaged in the projects that come to us through this network. And we had established relationships with all of these sites previously and then moved into having the, the data sharing infrastructure. So they had a sense of the kinds of projects that would come to them and wanted to be able to participate in those. I think it would be, um, it, it is a, a, a more significant hurdle to work with a larger health system. Um, that may be, you know, multiple hospitals, multiple both specialty and primary care systems, and we do uh, or clinics, and we do work with some of those as well. And we have not broached um, the involvement of those systems in DataQuest at this point. Um, the other thing is that, you know, they they have, um, in some ways, interestingly, more IT system hurdles, at least in our in our neck of the woods, because they have so many competing demands uh, for their IT groups that it's, it's difficult for them to participate. And while that's also true in the smaller systems, um, it's been um, easier in some ways to, to work with their IT groups there. And and our the burden on the clinics uh, and on the clinic systems that we work with is relatively low. I mean they the IT burden is that they need to be able to set up the, the server, basically, and create the connection to our vendor. And then when there are problems, they need to troubleshoot. So when their server goes down or when they make an update, they have to be able to um, provide us with that information. So that burden is relatively low. I would say the governance burden at the beginning and signing off on all the paperwork has actually taken the longest because all of the organizations um, have felt that they needed to take that to their lawyers and look at that because of the the um, issues around HIPAA. And there's, there are, we talked about a memorandum of understanding and a, and a data use agreement. Those are with us um, at the University of Washington. But there's also business associate agreements that have to be signed um, with the vendor. So there is more paperwork than I, than I should. Great. Thank you. Uh, kudos to you for persevering through all those uh, obstacles. <laughs> yeah. And continuing to do so. LJ, I see a hey, question that you yeah. have there. Did you want to? 
Yeah, I, I just was kind of getting an idea what what it takes in terms of uh, you've done a really impressive job of engagement uh, uh, through these uh, uh, small projects and uh, okay. and I just kind of wonder what it takes in terms of staffing and communication to leveling the playing field. Uh, you've had a really great outcome, but uh, I suspect there's a fairly significant investment in making this happen. Well. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's always an investment. There's an investment in making a PDRN happen, as we all know. Um, so we do this within the funding that is provided, uh, you know, to us for our network coordinator and for us as uh, investigators in the PDRN. We have a 75% network coordinator who is um, a very skilled um, research scientist who can do everything from project management to qualitative to quantitative uh, research. And then um, in our PBRN we have roughly, um, oh, I would say about 45% of investigator time. And so what we've done is really tried to fit the scale of these projects into the work that we would be largely doing otherwise. Um, although obviously, so so we fit it into our annual meeting, and so we do a lot of the work with um, our uh, site champions at the annual meeting itself. Um, and then I would say we have, oh, probably roughly, well, the first year we did the HR project, we had roughly four meetings with our um, site champions along the way to do everything from uh, choosing the topic to vetting um, the parameters to getting their feedback on the results. Um, but at this point, most of that we do um, virtually, so electronically. Um, and, um, you know, we hold several webinars. So, I mean, I, I, I would say um, probably 10% of our network coordinator's time is spent on this project over the course of the year. Um, and perhaps 5% of an investigator. It's actually not as time intensive as, as you'd think. But it's not nothing. That's great. Yeah. And um, one thing that I wanted to mention as well is that I, uh, both our uh, data quest data sharing infrastructure, we also invite uh, investigators to work with our, um, with our network um, on any project, really. We work on national projects all the time, and um, we enjoy doing so. Uh, we really enjoy facilitating um, other researchers working with our network. Um, and we would also, we actually have, uh, for this electronic health record project, we have a uh, kind of a how-to uh, packet. And so if you would be interested in receiving that how-to packet, just let me know. Um, again, this is Jim Warner. I have another question for you. Um, it, it really is remarkable how much this is stimulated in your, in your PBRN with the number of grants that you've been able to, to obtain and projects you've been able to conduct. For the infrastructure, though, you know, you were talking about the challenges of the cost of this and the personnel to manage it. Are those costs, those infrastructure costs in doing this um, per practice and, and things like that in maintenance, um, are those covered by the CTSA or are those covered by individual projects or how, how, uh, how do you go about paying for those things? Yeah, it's a patchwork. Um, so we try to bring as many sites on as we can um, via grants. So right now, we have uh, a, a grant from our ARC, from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, that has paid for um, bringing on eight new clinics into our DataQuest network and for the duration of the grant is paying for the maintenance costs. We had some an, a, initial uh, monies that came from uh, NCAS that was a um, a supplement to our CTSA that we wrote that uh, provided the initial funding um, for the for the development of DataQuest. And the way that we um, worked out that uh, funding is we had a little bit of a piggy bank um, that we were able to set up with the vendor. So that has been able to sustain it. But um, we it is it does require infrastructure funding. And this is true for PVRNs as well. So it's really a matter of, you know, how can you uh, demonstrate the value of this 
to uh, the folks who have some infrastructure funds. At this point in our institution, we've been very lucky to be able to engage our CTSA and to um, be able to demonstrate the value of this to the CTSA, um, as well as obviously to our practices. Great. Uh, Chet, you had a similar question about who did the small EHR projects this is Chet, from Chet Fox. Yeah, so um, as I think I outlined how the, the PBRN um, funds its part of that. We, we take that uh, out of the FTE funding that we receive for our PBRN from our CTSA. The sites themselves obviously contribute their own um, their own resources to be able to do the electronic health record polls and to participate in the project, uh, the project themselves. So that is uh, quote unquote donated resources from our site. And that's again I think one of the reasons that we um, really use this engagement approach because the sites care uh, about the answers to the questions and they're excited to get the answers to the questions and to be a part of it. And uh, so uh, that's that's one of the reasons that they're willing and able to do um, to get the the data from uh, their sites and to participate. Um, but we don't have full scale participation. I would say about half of the organizations in our um, in our PBRN participated last um, in the last year, and we'll see what it looks like this coming year. Um, the first year we did the project, I'd say seven, I think seven or eight of our sites participated. Seeing the results at the annual meeting really stimulated a lot of other sites to want to participate and to want to ask a new question. So. Great. Um, just, just a quick comment. Uh, I can see that this has brought tremendous capacity to your network. And also, you know, with a network that's uh, over a large geography, um, this probably is really a nice tool for collaboration across sites where you are unable to bring people together all the time, you know, on a regular basis in the same room. Uh, so. Uh, but I don't want to hold up uh, the, the webinar too much. No, we should keep going. Here. Yeah, because we've yeah, got another go important example. Alex? Okay, great. Yeah, and, and there'll be some time too at the end here where we can have uh, uh, general questions, uh, not just about this next uh, section, but but going back to the other sections as well. Um, so, um, uh, Alex, uh, Laura May, and I thought. Um, it might be nice to kind of have a little shift in direction um, uh, uh, from some of the traditional um, uh, EHR data to thinking about a little bit about um, how to engage patients in interacting with their data um, and, and also uh, where the potential value may come in of, of patient reported data and, and how that could supplement uh, PBRN research. and. Um, uh, and then what are some of the challenges and, and um, facilitators in order to be able to, to do some of this work. So I'm, I'm going to share an example of something that we've been doing in our network, um, but try and use that more as a, a starting point uh, to just uh, talk some about the issues. And, and once again, I'll leave time for questions, so please, um, as I'm talking, post questions. I can see it in the chat box, and we can make sure we get to this. Um, so, so we've been working a lot with trying to crack open our patient portals and take all that data that we've got in the electronic health records and, and share it with patients and um, engage patients, use that to engage patients in their care, but then our research line has also been engaging patients and the practices taking care of these patients to think about the workflows and how do we do this and how do we put it into practice. Um, how do we implement it, um, and, and then our research team has been using that for some of our, our research portfolio. So the example that I wanted to, to share with the fellows here uh, on this webinar um, was, was from a study that we had through the Patient Centered Outcomes Research uh, Network uh, Institute um, where we wanted to um, uh, reach out to patients outside of the clinical setting um, before a visit, but not necessarily related to a visit, and start thinking about how they're thinking or helping them think about um, uh, 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 what they want to do or don't want to do around cancer screening decisions. And uh, we decided to look at a couple of scenarios where 
uh, patients might have a couple choices to make. Um, and, and this was something that our, our practices were interested in because it could help to facilitate and to streamline um, care. And then from a technology standpoint, um, one of the things that, that we were excited about was being able to take the technology and through integrating this into the workflow, um, basically follow what happens um, kind of over a decision lifestyle, a life cycle, reaching out to patients before encounters, thinking about and getting them to think about what their um, what their values and preferences are and where they're at with making decisions, following them into the encounter with the EHR data, and then following them outside of the encounter afterwards and reaching back out to clinicians and patients um, and, and hearing about what happened and trying to build this on the, the existing patient portal platforms uh, that were in place in our practices as well as the electronic health records to make this research collection and care delivery process automated. So one of the things that we started out with, and I think that this, this is an interesting model for thinking about how technology could help um, and be used in, 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 in uh, facilitating care and how we can study this process, we brought a bunch of patients and clinicians together and started talking about what's the workflow and, and how does this look and it, how would this work and be integrated into usual care. And they basically came up with a workflow where we would use existing EHR data to pre-identify patients who might be facing some type of a decision. Reach out to them and say, hey, you know, our practice wants to help you with this. Um, come log into our portal and have patients log in and then explore their preferences, which is the number two here, and then personalize the type of educational material and prompts and information we might show them. A lot of our current systems have some basic standardized educational material like HealthWise or other things built into it. But really there's a new level that we can think about where we can have patients see and interact with their data and have their data change the type of educational material and prompts and information that we want to share with them. And then after patients do this, we wanted them to be able to share this information with their clinicians, hopefully have that prime visit. Um, then they would have an encounter with their clinician, hopefully make a better decision. Then we would follow up with them afterwards, um, both in terms of making sure that they um, followed through on their decisions, but also to hear about experiences. So here's a little bit of the data that I wanted to show, and I think that this brings up a really interesting um, challenge in primary care practices um, and that our PDRNs are facing. Um, for these practices that were participating, they had 72,000 patients that were, were using the portals. And over a, a six-month time period, what we found is that there were 11,000 patients facing these routine common decisions. So this is something above and beyond the capacity of what practices can normally accomplish, and the technology allowed this to really be automated and, and facilitated. Um, the next thing that's kind of interesting that we found with this experience is that going and implementing this in practices, there was relatively less uptake than we thought there would be. About 20% to 30% of patients uh, would, would start engaging in this type of a process. And, and this is something that we've seen um, as a common uh, a challenge with doing these types of, of, of IT interventions in some of our practices, um, which is that it takes a little while to kind of institutionalize this, both for clinicians and for patients. So often when they're asked repeatedly to come and do something like this, we see uptake increasing over time. So in the context of a research study where you have a one-time period for doing this, it's often uh, a little bit more of a challenge to get people to routinely do this, but there's still relatively high uptake, and when you implement this on a system-wide level, this represents um, tens of thousands of patients. Then the other thing that's interesting through integrating this in care, and it allowed us to basically follow up with patients as part of this through the portal, through portal surveys to um, see what's happening. Um, and we find that this process of sharing that health information with the patients um, really seemed to help patients uh, be more engaged in decisions. It seemed to motivate them to participate more in discussions uh, with their doctor, it reduced their fears, got them more involved than they would have otherwise just kind of walking cold into an encounter. And there were a number of things that, 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 um, that have been important to us um, in order to be able to do some of these, these activities where we're 
uh, harnessing portals to reach out to patients and get them to report information. And then that goes into our EHR, becomes part of our, our research database, but it also becomes part of our intervention and our um, uh, 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 the care delivery process. So, so one big facilitator of, of the research um, for us with the HIT is that the act of collecting the data was also supporting the act of delivering care. We are able to do this a little bit better because we had some control over the design and programming of the patient portal. We've been extending this into other settings where they have more structured portals like Epic's MyChart. And there's certainly ways to do this in, in these settings as well. Um, the other important facilitator for making this happen, because we are trying to do things to implement it and integrate it in the workflow, that patient and clinician engagement was really, really critical to the success throughout the process. And then the automation uh, that the, the IT systems allowed really supported something that happened over and over and over again in practice to be more routine. So those were all good things. Um, some of the barriers for trying to engage patients in reporting information through the portals and the EHR, we do have limited control over how we could interact with the EHR, and particularly around restructuring the EHR database. So patients will report information, and there aren't normal fields that this type of information goes into. And that can be a challenge. And then often more time and repetition is needed to make these things happen. And then that finding that balance between the, the clinical care versus the research data collection, that's a tight balance to find. We talked earlier about data cleaning. One of the benefits I didn't put here that, that, that we found with the patient reported information is not only can we get access to data that we don't normally have as clinicians, patient perspectives, beliefs, values, health behaviors, these things, um, but they can actually help us clean our data, too. So patients go in, they see their, their electronic health record data, and they make corrections. And, and that's been a good thing for us in cleaning up some of our EHR data. It's been good for our clinicians, although many of our practices get scared about that at times as well. It's been a good way to engage the patients in their care and to move care outside of traditional office visits and then a good data source. And I want to point out, if you're not aware of it, for the, the fellows in particular, that you know, this idea of trying to capture patient-reported data is, is, is um, uh, endorsed by many different uh, groups. So um, ONC, through meaningful use, is, is you know, one of the metrics is engaging patients and family in their care through HIT. Um, the Institute of Medicine here has uh, gone through a series of activities to sort of uh, define what are the social and behavioral domains that we should be measuring and recording uh, repeatedly in electronic health records. There's um, 10 different domains, each with an instrument that um, is in this phase two document. And that's a good framework for thinking about how to um, uh, uh, structure the type of data that you might want to collect directly from patients. And hopefully the EHR vendors will catch up and start to create uh, structured data fields to be able to handle this information. So that's the, the basic gist of the information about engaging patients um, to report their information. So we can stop here. I see we've got six minutes left total, and we can take questions on this third section as well as uh, the other sections as well. Okay, fellows, uh, we just have six minutes left. So uh, who has a question for our presenters? I see Andrew Hunt has a question. What are the best types of questions projects for first-time electronic health record data research for a young PBRN without data system integration capacity? Uh, this is Alex. Chris, I'll, I'll jump in uh, with, with, uh, with one one idea of a, a place to go, um, and, and I, I think Laura May and Alex Fix probably will have some ideas as well. Um, one of the reasons I thought it was important early on in the introduction to, to talk about implementation uh, as a potential field, I, I think understanding how um, HIT is being used and how it's being implemented and put into practice is an easier area to start if you don't have a lot of data system integration capacity and you don't have a lot of IT um, uh, uh, support. 
Um, this is something that many of our practices are interested in working on and, and want to improve and can be less resource intensive than some of these examples we've discussed today. Yeah, this is Laura May. I would say that uh, a project that emanates from your practices is going to be the best type of project uh, because particularly as a young PBRN, you want to solidify the commitment and engagement of the site. So I would start to elicit their questions and try to then sort out what's most feasible um, for your, uh, what, what type of methodology might be most feasible for your, for your network to undertake. And it's Alex Fix here. I, I agree with what's been said. I think sometimes there can be very simple chart reviews that can be done that get at salient questions and sometimes you know, the easiest things to do are, are with data that's in discrete data fields, which we didn't even get into, but data from notes is often hard to tease apart, but data about things like vital signs, um, medications used, tests ordered, those kinds of things can be very helpful. And I think it's good if it's related to the practice, you know, priorities, as Laura May said, and also in if it provides some pilot data for a project that could build upon it. So for example, if you found that nobody in, you, in a given set of practices was screening their patients for colon cancer, that could very easily set up a future study. I, I think that it's nice to have it lead into something where there's, there's a real uh, uh, benefit down the road from the preliminary work. Great. Um, Laura May, would you consider DartNet to be a, gr a good resource for um, a PBR in, th in this situation where they don't have much experience or capacity with, with uh, integration of, of electronic health records into their, their research capacity um, just to, as a place to start? Um, well, there's a couple of, of ways that DartNet can help. If you are thinking about becoming uh, a, a, a PBRN that, that has a data sharing infrastructure, then uh, DartNet Institute is a wonderful resource to um, share how they do that work. And they can actually, I mean, they are our vendor. So, um, and, I, and I think, Alex, they're your vendor too, isn't that right? For CER? They, yeah, for pros, um, and CER squared, we have used DartNet, and they've built not all of the data comes through DartNet, but a bunch historically has. Right. Um, so they're very good, but if I mean if it's if it's really a truly small scale project, that might go beyond what you need. But I think that they have great expertise about thinking about you know about getting data out of different practices and how to synthesize it. Right. So so if you wanted to create a data sharing infrastructure, I think it's a great resource. It's also a great resource if you want to do a project using um, data from other networks. If you don't have the capacity to do that in your network, but you had a question and you wanted to get data in from multiple sources, it would be an excellent partner in that way, too. Thank you. And I see Alex Fix has a question uh, for, for Alex Christ. How did you get such a high level of participation in your portal? And Alex, you're talking generally about engaging patients and, and using the portal over time? And specifically your, you know, the interventions you did around screening. Yeah, we've, um, a lot of it, a lot of the, I'd love to take credit for that work. Actually, a lot of that work, though, was, was really our practices, and it was, um, it the the we we have um, been been studying through a, another series of grants um, how to patients engaged online with their portals, and and that process was bringing the clinicians and patients together to think through this work workflow and how to make it part of routine care. So a lot of it had to do with sort of building the culture in the practices that that this is how the care was was being delivered. Um, and, and making it available and accessible to patients. So um, as they started doing that and kind of the repetition of, uh, of this being kind of the normal process and the normal norm and, and, and it increases and improves access and communication 
um, with your doctor as well as to your health information, um, that, that started to help a lot with, with increasing um, the, the patient engagement. And I think what we found too with the, the patients that as they were able to use the portal more to be able to help them meet their needs, that further increased um, the, the, the use and the access. So you know, overall across many of these sites and through these studies, they've had about 60% of their population online um, and having chronic conditions and actually even being a little older, um, both of those increased the likelihood patients were to get online and engage with their information and their clinician online. Excellent. Well, I want to thank our presenters for a fantastic presentation today. Um, you know, as I see this, uh, what we've talked about in the last several weeks has been really essential to kind of um, understanding where PBRNs are and where they're really headed in, in new directions. Um, and it, what we see today, I think, from our presenters is the tremendous capacity that data sharing brings. And um, just keep in mind, too, I think the uh, the opportunities that are then available to networks that have this capacity, uh, the RFAs that you can respond to because you have data sharing capacity. There are so many different opportunities, I think, available, so many more opportunities available to networks who are able to do this. So, um, And it is certainly not going to become a smaller piece of, of the PBRN puzzle in the future. It's going to become much bigger, I think. So. Again, thank you, um, Laura May, Alex, and Alex, for a wonderful presentation today. And I thank the okay. participants. And um, definitely, if anyone would like to contact any of us, I'm sure we'd be happy to, you know, field questions or talk in greater detail about specific, you know, specific approaches or problems. Absolutely. We look forward to hearing from you. Great. Thank you so much. We'll uh, share your information, your contact information, with uh, the fellows. Great. So, Thank fellows, you, uh, thank you. Fellows, we have two seminars, two webinars in the month of February. So, on February 4th, we'll have a webinar by Miriam Dickinson on sampling and nested analyses in PBRNs. And then on the 18th, um, Mary, um, Nancy Elder will discuss quali qualitative methods and multi method research in PBRNs. So, those are two excellent methodological. Um, methodological webinars that are coming up for us. Um, okay, so um, that concludes our, our webinar for today, and we'll uh, provide information about our presenters to you. Thanks, thanks to everybody. Take care. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 -bye.